Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. We're looking for, what are we looking for? Um, we're looking for a prayer book hymnal set that was left under a seat and lost in Diana Kerwin's name. So it's like an Easter egg hunt. It should be someplace under a seat if somebody can check. Everybody just check under your seat. So we're looking for a prayer book hymnal combination that has Deacon Diana's name on it. Yes. It should be under the chair someplace. <laughs> Think of this like an early Easter egg hunt. It's an early Easter egg hunt. If you find it, Jesus gets to rise from the dead on Sunday. There we go. Winner, winner. So tonight we're going to have evening prayer, evening prayer for Palm Sunday. So you need an evening prayer booklet that should be at the entrance of the church. And uh, we will start here in a few short seconds. So grab your evening prayer. Let's gather for some silence before we begin. And then we'll begin solemn evening prayer for Palm Sunday.
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory, Glory to, to the, the Father and to the Son and to the, Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was in the beginning, beginning is, is now and will be forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the Psalms. As we recite the Psalms for evening prayer, I will recite the odd verses if you'll reply with the even. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore I shall not be confounded. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. The world and all who dwell therein. For it, For it is, is he, he who founded it upon, upon the seas and made it firm upon the rivers of the deep. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord and who can stand in his holy place? Those, Those who, who have clean hands and a pure heart, who have not pledged themselves to falsehood nor sworn by what is a fraud, they shall receive a blessing from the Lord and a just reward from the God of their salvation. Such, Such is the generation of those who seek him, of those who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift them high, O everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who, Who is, is this King, King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift them high, O everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Glory, glory to, to the, the Father, and, and to the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, and will be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. For the Lord God will help me, therefore I shall not be confounded. The blood of Christ washes away our sins. And makes, makes us worthy, worthy to, to serve, serve the living God. God. Ascribe to the Lord, you gods. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Mount Hermon like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord splits the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees writhe and strips the forest bare. And in the temple of the Lord, all are crying glory. The Lord sits enthroned above the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forevermore. The Lord shall give strength to his people. The Lord shall give his people the blessing of peace. 
Glory Glory to to the the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit, as it was in the beginning, beginning, is now, now, and will will be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. The blood of Christ washes away our sins and makes us worthy to serve the living God. He was pierced for our offenses and burdened with our sins. By his wounds we are healed. Christ Christ also also suffered suffered for you, leaving you an an example, so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. He was pierced for our offenses and burdened with our sins. By his wounds we are healed. reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he cured them. But when the chief priest and the scribes saw the amazing things that he did and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry and said to him, do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise for yourself. He left them, went out to the city, to Bethany, and spent the night there. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to you. It is written, I will strike the shepherd down and the sheep of his flock will be scattered. But after my resurrection, I will go before you into Galilee There you will see me, says the Lord. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. It is written, I will strike the shepherd down, and the sheep of his flock will be scattered. But after my resurrection, I will go before you into Galilee. There you will see me, says the Lord. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit 
and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. That this evening may be holy, good, and peaceful. We entreat you, O Lord. That your holy angels may lead us in paths of peace and goodwill. We entreat you, O Lord. That we may be pardoned and forgiven for our sins and offenses. We entreat you, O Lord that there may be peace to your church and to the whole world. We entreat you, O Lord, that we may depart this life in your faith and fear and not be condemned before the great judgment seat of Christ. We entreat you, O Lord, that we may be bound together by your Holy Spirit in the communion of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Saint Joseph, and all your saints, entrusting one another in all our life to Christ. We entreat you, O Lord, Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, triumphed over the powers of death and prepared for us our place in the new Jerusalem, grant that we who have this day given thanks for his resurrection may praise you in that city of which he is the light, where he lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our companion in the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope that we may know you as you are revealed in Scripture and the breaking of bread. Grant this for the sake of your love. Amen. Please feel free to vocalize your petitions and prayers for yourselves, your loved ones, and for the world. Holy Spirit may come upon us all mightily during this holy week. Together we pray the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus, we give you unworthy servants, you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. 
And you have promised to your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Bow down before the Lord and pray for his blessing. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.
scroll on me. All right. Let's get to it. Good evening, everybody. Great to have you here on this Palm Sunday night. Uh, let's begin on page one of your notes. If you haven't got your notes, they should be in the center of your tables. Uh, we will need notes today along with the Book of Common Prayer. As you know, our subject for today is Holy Week and the words that we said, especially during the Eucharistic prayer, uh, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, which is what we're going to be up to here the next couple days. So let's join in the collect for Palm Sunday that's found on the top of the first page of your notes on page one. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us an example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and to also share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you all for coming again today. Most of you were here for the 10 o'clock Eucharist, which was awesome, or earlier. Uh, it was one of our largest attendants since COVID, so praise God for that. Um, today we're going to kind of unpack the theology of Holy Week, especially the theology of the Paschal Triduum, the Great Three Days. You know, I always like to give you extra books to read if you want. One of the books that we'll be looking at a little bit from is this one here called This is the Night by Jim Farwell. Jim is a priest. Uh, he teaches liturgy at Virginia Theological Seminary, BTS. Uh, he was actually a year ahead of Mother Lynn and Father Frank in seminary, so they know him pretty well. So we'll be, you'll see a couple snippets from him in the books that we have, I mean, the stuff we're going to tackle today. But a lot of it is my stuff, and another guy that you will see all over the place, Pius Parsh. Uh, Pius Parsh, if you notice, he lived between 1884 and 1954. Uh, he was one of the leads of the liturgical movement of the 20th century. I've learned a lot from him. He was a Norbertine canon, so he was a can member of the canon's regular of the Order of St. Norbert, uh, and one of his fellow confreres, uh, Father William Fitzgerald, was a Norbertine canon, and he taught me everything I know about liturgy. My mom's saying, yeah, I remember Father William. Uh, he was awesome. He was from uh, Australia, but he was an abbot from Ireland, and so most everything that I know from liturgy, I know from the good Father William. So let's dive into it, and I promise not to get too excited, but you know how I am with Holy Week, if you can't tell. And the liturgies that are all over here. But I want to break down before we get into it. Kind of just four themes. Five themes. First of all, what is happening this week? This is from Pius Parsh. The first kind of paragraph that you see there. Now we enter the holiest part of Lent. The church has prepared us step by step for this sacred experience. A steady crescendo in the liturgy has been taking place... ...since the beginning of Lent. Each week the sound rose higher and louder. Although Mother Church often spoke about the cross and resurrection... ...she did so in veiled signs and figures... ...as if she feared exposing the most precious object to profane eyes. And not until this moment does she remove the curtain... ...and now we see the Holy of Holies. And more than that, we are asked to participate... ...that's key... ...in the most sublime drama of religious history. The greatest and holiest of weeks is about to begin. All of Lent, as I've been mentioning since before Lent started... ...two weeks before Lent, you're all shaking your head yes, right? I always say, you shall come out of Lent. You should come out of Lent a substantially different Christian than you began it. Because Lent ends with us, as Pius Parch says... ...being asked to participate in the most sublime drama of religious history. Being able to participate. That is key. You know, I talk about the word remembrance a lot. If you notice our theme, recalling his death, resurrection and ascension. When I take the bread and the wine in my hands... ...this is my body, this is my blood. Do this in what of me? Remembrance. Now, I always talk about that word because it's awful in English. 
in English is kind of just a warm, fuzzy memory. We go back to it just like we go back to our yearbook pictures where we had more hair and we were really skinny. Okay, that's what it means to remember. That's not what the church says. When Jesus spoke those words, do this in remembrance of me, the Greek word that is used is anamnesis. Anamnesis. It's a participating in the events as if they're happening now. When we gather for the Eucharist, although that event with Jesus took place 2,000 years ago, in our Lord, these are now mysteries. Mysteries aren't Agatha Christie, right? Angela Lansbury, murder mysteries of a problem to solve. Mysterion means it is such an infinite rich thing that it's no longer held in space and time. So the events that we're celebrating in 2023 here in New Albany, where Jesus takes bread in his hands and says, do this in remembrance of me. At that moment, we are catapulted spiritually back to the upper room as if it were happening now. As if it's happening now. Wrap your head around that. So when Pius Parse says we are asked to participate, you are not spectators this week. I am not up here. I may wear the most fabulous copes that the world has ever seen. But this is not a theater production or a cooking demonstration. You are entering into the events. All of us are entering to the events as if it were happening right now and you are spiritually there. In the signs, the gestures, the material things. I'm going to show little kids here pretty soon. We are present in those events. When you picked up the palms today and you walked the Palm Sunday procession and you waved the palms, I love it. We know from scripture the little kids led us in it and I loved it that Gene was on his dad's shoulders waving a palm branch because that's exactly what it would look like during the time of Jesus. You are catapulted back to the events as if it was happening now. Which means when we get to Monday, Thursday, we come into the upper room. Our Lord washes our feet. We sit at supper with him where he says, this is my body, this is my blood. We'll take the Eucharist as you're going to hear and we're going to go to the garden. And you get to go to the garden. And what's even more awesome is all the apostles, because they carb loaded at the Passover meal, fell asleep. You have the ability to stay awake. ...and be present with Christ... ...even that the apostles couldn't do. You'll be there on Good Friday... ...where we reverence the cross. And then the greatest liturgy of the church's year... ...the Easter Vigil... ...the greatest liturgy of the church's year... ...is the moment of Easter... ...because when we read the scriptures... ...do the scriptures actually tell us... ...about the moment that Jesus rose from the dead? No. All four gospel accounts... ...start with the empty tomb... Not the moment of the resurrection. He's not here. He's raised. But none of the gospels depict the moment of the resurrection. In the Easter vigil, you get to experience the resurrection. Because it's no longer held in time and space. We now participate in the events as if they're happening now. So I tell people, Holy Week and especially the three greatest days are the most important things you could do all year. We take it for granted so often. Since I was a little kid, you weren't going to pull me away from the church on those days. I wanted to be with Jesus during that whole time because there's nothing more important, not anything on TV, not my naps, not anything else fun to do, because I think this is fun, but I'm talking in the secular world, right? There is nothing more important. Because number two in this paragraph is we get to experience the cross and the resurrection, which are the foundation stones of who we are. Let's continue with pious parch. How shall we live this week? We should not call this week a week of mourning, for the cross and the resurrection are inseparable. Christ's redemptive work did not end in death. It continues on with the victory of his resurrection. Therefore, we must not separate the passion from the resurrection, but rather regard the cross as the way to Easter victory. The liturgy does not make this week one of sorrowful lamentation 
or tearful sympathizing with our suffering Lord. That was the medieval approach. No. Through the whole week, there runs a note of victory and joy, a realization that Christ's sacred passion was a prerequisite to Easter. We cannot understand the church's liturgy unless we keep this in mind. There is no day in the entire coming week when the theme of Easter and victory does not sound loud and clear. Think only of Palm Sunday with its homage to the king that we celebrated today, of Holy Thursday with its solemn mass, of Good Friday with the solemn exaltation of the cross, of Holy Saturday, the beginning of the Easter solemnities, which means literally, literally Easter is happening right now. So the theme of the resurrection and our Lord's passion and death go through all of it. We call these days days of the Paschal mystery. Paschal meaning Passover mystery. And what is these great events? Our Lord's passion, his death, and his resurrection. That's called the Paschal Mystery. And Christ invites you into it. And it should change us. Quote three. This comes from Father Jim Farwell in his book, This is the Night. The Triduum, the Triduum liturgies center on the remembrance and celebration of the culminating events of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, his passion, death, and resurrection. And this line is very key. Christians in most every place and age have taken these events as the key to the whole of the divine relationship with the world. These days make the world. It's how God relates to us and how we as a church live and operate in the world. They define us. That's why it always mind blows me when Monday, Thursday and Good Friday come rolling around and churches are sparse. Because these are days and the foundation of who we are that make us the disciples that we are. Because it's the way Christ has gone into the world and resurrected the world and we're called to enter into that reality and to participate in it. Why is it called holy or great? This week we call Holy Week. I love this. This comes from St. John Chrysostom. We call the week great, not because it has a greater number of hours, other weeks having many more hours after all. I don't know what he was talking about there. Not because it has more days, there being the same number of days in this and the other weeks, of course. So why do we call this week great? Because in it, Many ineffable good things come our way. In it, protracted war is concluded. Death is eliminated. Curses are lifted. The devil's tyranny is relaxed. His pomps are despoiled. The reconciliation of God and humanity is achieved. Heaven is made accessible. Human beings, look at this, human beings are brought to resemble angels. Those things which were at odds are united. The wall is weighed low. The bar is removed. The God of peace having brought peace to things on high and things on earth. This then is the reason we call the week great. Because in it the Lord lavished on us such a plethora of gifts. This is the reason many people intensify their fasting. As well as their sacred watching and vigils. The practice of almsgiving. ...thus showing by their behavior the regard they have for the weak. After all, since the Lord in this week has regaled us with such good, great goods... ...how are we not obliged to demonstrate our reverence and regard as fast and far as we can? If he's given us such good things... ...how are we not obliged to give such great things back to him? Which is why I say participate in all of it. Don't let one of it go away. These are sacred times which are the most important thing that you can do. And you walk moment by moment with the Lord this week like we do not any other time of the year. If you notice today, we walked with him from Bethany to Bethphage. We walked with him as he entered into the city. And if weirdly you notice what happened at evening prayer. The gospel at evening prayer was about him doing what? For those who are here for evening prayer. Cleaning out the temple. Why? Because that's exactly what he did on Palm Sunday evening. <laughs> the evening sacrifice would have taken place at 3 o'clock. 
or the last lamb of the day was sacrificed, there would have been a huge incense and incensing of the altar area, probably because of the number of things that were slaughtered during the day, and they had to clean up the smell of the heavenly barbecue. But in the evening, there was incense, and as Jesus comes in, I, I, I was talking to Matt about this. Here they're expecting the Messiah, the guy who's going to kick out the Romans, right? He comes on a donkey. That would have shaken people up. All these people are carrying on about Hosanna, reenacting the liturgy of Sukkot. And I'm sure people were expecting him to go right to Pilate's praetorium with a whole caravan of people and start the overthrow. And what does he do? He goes to his father's house with a whip in his hand. And he starts knocking over the money changers. That's what he did on this night. Pooh. And if you notice how it ended... The cries of Hosanna for the kids were still ringing in the temple and the priests and the religious leaders said enough. And then what does Jesus do? Where does he go? Back to Bethany. Back to Bethany to Martha, Mary and Lazarus. That's where he stays tonight. And he comes back to the temple tomorrow to start preaching again. We get to follow the Lord all through this week. But more importantly, the last three days, which are called the sacred Paschal Triduum. Why is it called Triduum? On page two. These three days may be regarded as a unit in themselves. A true Triduum or trilogy. A three-part drama of Christ's redemptive work. Each day from Thursday to Sunday is one long Eucharist in three parts. You wouldn't watch Return of the Jedi without watching all the other two stuff. Because you don't understand what's going on. It's the same way, right? You have to be a part of all three to understand it. You have to walk with our Lord on Monday, Thursday to the upper room where he begins his passion. You've got to walk with him to Golgotha on Good Friday where he lays down his life. And then you've got to walk to the empty tomb. If you just run to the empty tomb, you miss the whole thing. Right? Because it's one long liturgy and we're going to talk about that liturgy. All right, where's my little kids? Who's left? Come on up. Bring them up here. We're going to start with you all. I'm going to show you some stuff. Come on up. If you want to knock on that window and get Gene and Mason, that'd be great. What's up, gang? Come on up. I want to show you some cool stuff. This is show and tell. This is pre show and tell at this point. Come on up, Gene. Y'all want to see some cool stuff we're going to use during the week? Because we're going to talk about all the different ways we get to touch and experience stuff with Jesus. What is this called? Anyone want to hold it? Yeah, go ahead. You can all grab it. What is that? Anyone know what that is? What? A palm. A palm leaf. What are you supposed to do with it? Uh, hold it up. Yeah, hold it up. We did it this morning. And what did we do with it? Yeah, what you're doing. We're waving it. Because back in the day, they cried out to Jesus, waving palm branches, Hosanna. How many of you got palms today? Did you get palms today? What did you do with them? I got three. You got three? <laughs> you can get more on the way out, too. What did you do with them when you got home? You played with them? Yeah, that's good, too, right? And you want to kind of put them near something that we used to pray with, whether it's a cross or your Bible or something like that, because they're blessed and they're holy. All right, let me take this back. I want to show you some other things we're going to use this week. Now, this is what the bishop is going to bless on Tuesday. It's special oil. You want to smell it? Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, you want to smell it? Cool, yeah. <laughs> this is called chrism oil. When you were baptized, this oil was put on your forehead in the sign of the cross. And the bishop consecrates this during the week. Because on Saturday and Sunday, we, we're going to baptize people. And so he gives us the oils that we're going to need for this week. It's also how Christ is our light and is our light, Lord. And he seals us. So that's why we use this. Now this thing here, you're going to have a field day with. Anyone know what this is called? What? It's a clacker. Crolatus in Latin. It means rattle. It means rattle. So on Holy Thursday or Monday Thursday, we sing the Gloria. We're going to talk about that. It's a big song of joy, and we're going to ring a bell. But as soon as that's done, 
we get really quiet during the next couple days until Jesus comes, rises from the dead. So we don't use bells. We use this. You want to you try it? Anyone, anyone know what it sounds like? It sounds like a hammer nailing in a nail. A hammer nailing in a nail. Yeah. Very good. So it's kind of to remind us of Jesus' passion when he died for us on the cross. Which is why we use it. It's kind of hammered to a wood. So every Easter, he's up on that cross. Yeah, that's it. he's over on that one. Hey, did you know he had an egg put on school? Yeah. On ten eggs. You found ten eggs. Do you know why we hide eggs on Easter? Yeah. Why? Because you say, because you, because you have to find them. Because you have to find them, right, yeah. Because they're symbols of Jesus. They're symbols of Jesus. You want to try? Let's get Owen a shot with that one. You want to play? You want to see if you can do that? Pretty cool. Pretty cool. So um, I got every Easter. So one Easter, the Easter Bunny let, hide, hid me twenty eggs. Wow! You must have been good that year. Cool. All right, you guys can go back with your folks. You can go back into the nursery. Whatever you want to do. Give me five. You did good. Have fun with the brick. There you go. All right. <laughs> Bet you all didn't know what that clacker was called. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Let's go to page two. Let's jump into the sacred Paschal Triduum, which begins with Monday, Thursday. And let's talk about, we talked about all the good things that the Lord does for us during the week. Let's talk about some of the themes of Monday, Thursday. With this Mass celebrated in the evening of Thursday in Holy Week, the Church begins the sacred Paschal Triduum and devotes herself to the remembrance of the Last Supper at which the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, loving those who were his own in the world even to the end, offered his body and blood to the Father under the appearance of bread and wine, gave them to the apostles to eat and drink, and then enjoined on the apostles and their successors in the priesthood to offer them in return. A lot of people don't realize we celebrate on Monday, Thursday, the Last Supper, we inst the institution of the Eucharist, where Christ gives us his body and blood, but it's also the day that he instituted the priesthood. The priesthood is instituted on that day. We'll talk about that too. This Mass, first of all, is the memorial of the institution of the Eucharist. The memorial of the Lord's Passover, by which under sacramental signs he perpetuated among us the sacrifice of the new law. The Mass of the Lord's Supper is also the memorial of the institution of the priesthood, by which Christ's mission and sacrifice were perpetuated in the world. And in addition, this Mass is the memorial of that love by which the Lord loved us even to death. Oh, yeah, by the way, I completely forgot about that. So middle school and high school kids follow Matt for their own. They have other stuff going on. Sorry, I get into this. I, you got to stop me. You got to stand up and wave. Yeah, I know. You know how that rolls. All right. Why is it called Mondi? Not Mandy. Mondi. Monday. Why is it called Monday or Holy Thursday? At this Mass, the Gospel reading, as we're going to hear, comes from John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. In Latin, mandatum novum do vobis utiligatis in vicem sicut delexi vos. Mandatum, commandment. Mandatum, Monday. In English, Old English, Maundy Thursday. What's the new commandment? Love as I have loved you. And how did Jesus love us? He washed us his feet. He gave us his very body and blood. And he will give us his very body and blood on the cross. So mandatum, mandate, commandment, mandate Thursday, Maundy Thursday. All right? All right, let's get into it. So how does it start? Sadly, we don't have introits like they used to back in the day. Introits are the opening hymn and the opening procession. But normally the first thing the church would cry out on this day is we should glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our salvation, our life. And notice right away, 
our resurrection. Through him we are saved and made free. Which is quoting Galatians chapter 13 verse 14. The first words out of the church's mouth are... ...through the cross we get to resurrection... ...where Christ saves us. That's what these three days are all about. Now we're going to be singing Lift High the Cross. It's kind of the same themes. That's going to be our opening. Sing them with joy. We will hear the Gloria for the first time... ...really since the beginning of Lent. If you notice, the Gloria has not been sung... What else has not been sung? Alleluia has not been sung. The church has been fasting from all this. And here on the first day of the Triduum, you will hear the Gloria. You will also hear a bell toll. Why will you hear the bell toll? Because the church has been, we have been fasting and praying and prepping for this for 40 days. And now we're finally here and you can already feel the joy in the church of the resurrection because we are here. So the bell begins to ring to let us know we are here. And once that bell is done and it'll ring all through the Gloria, bells aren't rung anymore. Because the Lord begins his passion and they won't ring again ...until we get to the great vigil of Easter. If we had a tower with a bell in it... ...that you normally hear at churches who ring all the time... ...if you listen, if you go into a city... ...you will not hear church bells... ...from the Monday Thursday liturgy until Easter. All bells are silent. There's no bells that are played or sung in those three days... ...because our Lord's going through his passion. And then we have an opening hymn. Song. Collect. Look at all the theology here. Almighty Father, whose dear Son on the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood, mercifully grant that we may receive it thankfully, and then here's that word, in remembrance, in anamnesis of Jesus Christ our Lord, who in these holy mysteries that we're talking about, not only in the Eucharist, but in these three days, give us a pledge of eternal life, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And then the church is going to teach us through the liturgy of the word and through the readings. The first reading always on Monday, Thursday comes from Exodus chapter 12. And it's all about the institution of the Passover. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. By the way, when you read the Exodus account, this is one of the only times where it says the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron. Why? Aaron is the first high priest. So the Lord is saying there is something very important and very liturgical going on here. This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month they are to take a lamb. And then you'll hear the rest on Monday, Thursday. But the descriptions for Passover and how it will begin is the first thing that's ushered. And I love there's a line in Exodus 12. This is the Lord's Passover. Not ours. Even back in Egypt, it was the Lord's doing that we enter into. We enter into Passover where he passes over from death to life. And we get the foreshadowing of that in Exodus. And we get the reality here when we celebrate the Eucharist. The psalm for that day is Psalm 116. And 1 Corinthians 10. Our blessing cup that we bless... Is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things that he has done for me? Notice the connection with the Eucharist. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. So we're starting to get hints of the Eucharist as the church teaches us. The second reading is Paul's letter to the Corinthians, his first letter. This is is the earliest account of the Eucharist in the New Testament. Obviously, Jesus celebrated the Passover earlier than Paul was writing. But this document from 1 Corinthians is the first fragment of the New Testament. Remember, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he just didn't hand the apostles the Gospels and said, hey, you guys, write your name on this. Right? They were compiled by the apostles. But Paul is writing about seven years ...after Jesus' death and resurrection. So 1 Corinthians dates to somewhere in the early 40s. In the early 40s. And the words that we receive from Paul in this letter... ...are heard on Monday, Thursday night. Look what Paul teaches us. I receive from the Lord what I also handed on to you. Paul's already got it. 
So this has already been in practice. What has it been practiced, Paul? That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If you notice, those are the exact same words I say at every Mass. They're from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. The church has literally been doing this since the Last Supper. 2,000 years. You want to talk about entering into the awesomeness of this? So if you notice, the first three readings are all about the Eucharist. And the prefiguring of the Eucharist. And Paul's teaching about the Eucharist. So you would expect on Monday, Thursday, the gospel is going to be about what? The Eucharist. Or taken from Matthew or Mark or Luke where Jesus, in the words of him celebrating the Eucharist. But that's not what's read on Monday, Thursday. What is read on Monday, Thursday? The washing of the apostles' feet. John chapter 13. Now, before the festival of Passover... Jesus, knew, I love these lines. These are some of the most beautiful lines in John. Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. And I love this line. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. To the end of what? Just his earthly life? He stopped loving us after the resurrection? He was like, that was hard. I'm out, deuces. No. To the end of death, right? Forever, forever. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, tied a towel around himself, then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. Remember, we're walking through Jesus through all the steps of his passion. And so the gospel reading and the liturgy that will follow is first and foremost about the foot washing. Because we don't need to read about the institution of the Eucharist. We get to celebrate the institution of the Eucharist after the foot washing, when we celebrate the Eucharist, where his body and blood become body and blood, bread and wine become body and blood for us. So we start with the foot washing. Why do we start with the foot washing? On the bottom of page three, you're going to hear me say this to you all on Monday, Thursday. After I do the, the gospel reading, Deacon Colleen does the gospel reading and I preach... I will come back out here, and this is from the book of Occasional Services, and I want you to listen to some of this stuff, which you're going to hear, because this is not in the book of Common Prayer. It's in our supplemental resources. Fellow, and then look what the church calls us, servants. Fellow servants of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the night before his death, Jesus set an example for his disciples by washing their feet, an example of humble service. He taught that strength and growth in the life for the kingdom of God that you are now a member of come not by power, authority, or even miracle, but by such lowly service. Therefore, I invite you who share in the royal priesthood of Christ. Notice the priesthood connection. To come forward that we may recall whose servant we are by following the example of our master, remembering his admonition that what we be done for us will also be done by us to others. For a servant is not greater than the master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. If you do them. Why the priesthood connection? Go to page four. In the Old Covenant, Moses gets a, a command from the Lord on how to ordain 
priests. Notice Exodus 29. You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and do what? Wash them with water. You shall take the other ram and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. You shall slaughter the ram and take some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear and the lobes of his right ears of his sons on the thumbs of their right hands and on the big toes of their right feet. ...and throw the rest of the blood against all sides of the altar. And then you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar... ...and some of the anointing oil... ...and sprinkle it on Aaron and his vestments. By the way, the anointing oil... ...the composition for the sacred chrism... ...is the same composition of the anointing oil... ...with all of its fragrances and the way it's made. By the way, totally the same. Take some of the oil and splatter it on their vestments... ...on his sons and his sons' vestments with him... ...and then he and his vestments shall be holy... ...as well as his sons and his sons' vestments. So notice the ordination rite. And by the time you get to Jesus... ...it goes more than the right thumb. They go to the lava... ...which is the water basin that was outside of the altar... ...in the main part of the temple. They would wash their head... ...their hands... ...and their feet. Then they would slaughter a lamb... And they would take some of the blood of the lamb and they would throw it on the altar. And then where else do they put it? Their head, their hands, and their feet. That's how the priests were ordained. And every time the priests came into the temple to practice their priesthood, they would come by the laver and they would wash their hands and they would wash their feet to remind them of their ordination. At the Last Supper... Jesus gets up, as you just heard from John. He takes off his garments. He puts on a towel. He gets down and he starts to wash the apostles' feet. And I love it in John. Peter is like, what are you doing? I'm washing your feet. No, you're not. Right? You got to love Peter. And our Lord then says something weird to him. Pete, if I don't do this... ...you will have no inheritance with me. And if you notice, Peter says something weird. Well, Lord, then do it to my hands and my head and my feet as well. Well, that's wacky. Jesus is down there just taking the dust off their feet. The Lord said something about inheritance... ...and then Peter jumped to dump it all over me. Why? Ezekiel chapter 44 verse 28... He's talking about the priests. This shall be their inheritance. I am their inheritance. And you shall give them no holding in Israel. I am their holding. The priests were not allowed to own anything. They got portions of the temple. And what was said of the priests... ...is that their inheritance was the Lord's. And so as Jesus is washing their feet and says no... He says, Peter, you will not have any inheritance with me. Peter then knew they were being ordained priests of the new covenant. And said, then do the whole ritual. Wash my head, my hands, and my feet as well. This is why we say the priesthood was instituted on this night. Where Jesus institutes the new covenant in his own blood. And the new priesthood. Not only are there some who ordain priests to minister back to the body of Christ, but as the church is teaching us, you all are members of the royal priesthood because you were washed, where? In the waters of baptism. And our inheritance now is the Lord's. When the foot washing ritual happens on Monday, Thursday, it's reminding you that you are a priest of the new covenant. In the royal priesthood of the baptized. And how do we exercise our ministry? By getting down and washing other people's feet. I I can't tell you the number of conversations I have with people who are like, oh, I'm not going up there to get my feet washed. Y'all get nervous. Because you think you're the only one that has ugly toes. It's just like saying, I'm a sinner, no one else is. Get over yourself. We all have ugly toes and ugly feet, and that's why God chose us. 
And he has come to get down into the nitty gritty with us. And he has called you with all of your faults and all of your foibles to be priests of the new covenant. To be priests of the new covenant. At your table, I want you just to talk with your table. And if you're kind of with one or two, go join a table that's got larger or come sit with other people. And talk about your experiences of the Monday Thursday foot washing ritual. Maybe you haven't done it before. Fess up. It's okay. We're all family. Maybe last year was your first time because you were nervous and I finally convinced you. Maybe you do it every year and it means something deep to you. But I just want you at your table to share with what your experience is of this ritual. All right? Five minutes. Ten minutes. Go at it.
All right, we're back. All right. Sorry, I'm, you know me, I talk so long, and I know I want to do a lot on the Easter Vigil, so we're going to put it in gear and kind of roll through here. Um, but I hope you had good table discussions, and I hope you're hearing each other, because I got to tell you, as a priest and anyone who's really present on that Monday, Thursday liturgy, you can really feel the love of Christ thick in the room during the foot washing ceremony. You really can. As you're watching others get their feet washed, as you're washing, I mean, it's all just really beautiful and incredible um, that God comes down to us all the way down to us. And so I hope you take advantage of that and I hope you participate and I hope hearing others' stories at your table, you come and participate in the rite this year. After the washing of the feet, Eucharist kind of continues as normal. We were with our Lord in the upper room as he gathers to celebrate the last, over, uh, last um, supper with us. And after everyone has received communion, things are a little bit different than how Eucharist normally ends. The Blessed Sacrament will be placed on the altar, and there will be a white veil over it. The church always veils things that are holy. This will be veiled. I begin to incense the Blessed Sacrament, and then we sing an ancient hymn written by St. Thomas Aquinas called the Pange Lingua, Sing My Tongue, the Glorious Triumph. It's written by St. Thomas Aquinas for the Solemnity of Corpus Christi. Um, we, we have an English translation. Obviously, Aquinas is writing in Latin. It's some of the most beautiful words, and I got to tell you, in Latin, it just kind of rings in supreme nocte cene, in the supreme great night of the Last Supper, all the, all the events, the beautiful events of what took place, we sing about. What's really cool is a lot of historians believe that the rhythm of the Pange Lingua, dun da dun da da dun da da dun da was actually come down to us from one of the marching songs of Caesar's legions, which is really neat. Uh, Ecce Caesar nuc triumphant. Caesar is triumphant. And it's kind of interesting that the church took kind of a soldier melody and did this because the true king, not Caesar, but the true king is going to be triumphant on the cross in a few short hours. And then we move with Jesus. As he leaves the upper room, you'll see the acolytes and me process out. We go out into this front room that's set up across from my office that's going to look like a garden. Because that, for the rest of the evening, is going to be where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. We call this time the Great Watch. Jesus said, "Can you, you heard it today, right, in the Gospel reading. Where Jesus is like, are you guys sleeping again, right? Can't you stay awake one hour with me? You get the ability to do it. You get the ability to stay there with him. And I encourage you, after that Eucharist, to spend time in there with him. You are making up what the apostles couldn't do. Remember that. And then the passion begins. Just as our Lord began in the Garden of Gethsemane to weep blood and to sweat. You will see that very stark in the church. Because right after we place him in the garden. You'll see the acolytes and the clergy come out just in our cassocks. And we all come. And the altar, which is going to look like this. Except for the white. I mean, excuse me, for the red altar cloth. So it's going to be pretty full. Is stripped. As everyone flees from Jesus. Remember, the altar cloth, this, is a symbol of all of us. It's a symbol of all of us. He clothes himself in the body. Notice the color of the altar cloth is the color that I wear and the deacons wear. And if we had a tunic, everyone would wear. But this symbolizes us. And this is ripped off. Because we all ran we all ran from the garden. We all ran when he started his passion. And you will see this beautiful altar turned down to nothing except for the bare wood. It's one of the most moving moments. Drew will begin to sing um, the psalm that is, um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It kind of begins the passion with us. I encourage you to read the night vigil, the watching with Jesus from the traveling nun, as I call her, Ageria. ...who is writing between 382 and 386. She goes from Spain for four years to spend with the, the church in Jerusalem... ...and in Galilee in that area. And she write, wrote, wrote meticulously all of their liturgies. And it will be shocking for you to find out. We're going to do this in a lot of this in level three... ...to see how all of what she described back in 300... ...is mostly the same identical liturgy that we're doing today. Which is really powerful. So read that for your homework. All right? 
Good Friday. Good Friday. Page 5. We're going to go back to John McDay, the Jesuits quote, but let's go to um, Pius Parsh because how the liturgy starts on Good Friday. By the way, if you notice on Monday, Thursday, how does Monday, Thursday end? It doesn't. It doesn't. We place Jesus in the garden. Deacon Colleen will read a paragraph from the gospel of Jesus' agony in the garden. And then we all walk away. That's part one. Notice there's no blessing. There's no dismissal. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. There's nothing. Because we pick up with act two on Good Friday at three o'clock. And how do we begin? Pius Parsh leads us. Good Friday is Christendom's great day of mourning. We enter the church. The church is empty. Bare of every adornment. There will be no holy water in the font that day. The tabernacle is open and empty. All this is an expression of silent interior grief. The service begins. There's no singing. There's no nothing. There's simply deep silence. There will be no candles on the altar. There's no cloth on the altar. If today, if ever, the church speaks loudly the language of sign and symbol, priests appear in black, the morning cover, color, and you will see when I come up here, we just lay on the floor. This powerless prostration on the floor expresses the desolate state of humanity before our redemption. I just stand up and say a prayer that goes back as far as 1100. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was... Notice that was the blessing tonight, by the way. ...willing to be betrayed, given into the hands of sinners... ...and to suffer death upon the cross... ...who lives and reigns forever and ever. And now the church teaches us. Isaiah 52. The suffering servant passages and prophecies from Isaiah. He was wounded for our transgressions... ...crushed for our infirmities. Upon him was the punishment that makes us whole... ...and by his bruises we are healed. The song that we will sing is Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which Jesus said from the cross. I hope we have time in level three to unpack that psalm. Because that psalm is actually about the resurrection. But we'll get to that in another class. We read from the letter to the Hebrews. Because Jesus now is the great high priest. Offering up the sacrifice of his own body. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we receive mercy and find grace and help of time and need. And then always on Good Friday we read from the Passion of St. John, which is some of the most beautiful theological ways of looking at Christ's passion and death. After the sermon... We have what's called the solemn collex. The form that we have today goes back at least to the year 500. All right? Which is incredible. The prayers of the people that we have every Sunday come from these ancient Good Friday prayers. The deacon will tell us who we're praying for. All these various people of the church, those who are about to be baptized, this parish, blah, 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 blah. And normally if we had kneelers, this is where we all do calisthenics. The deacon would say, let us kneel. And we all kneel. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to pray for all those things the deacon told us to pray for. And then the deacon says, get up and stand. And then we offer one prayer to the Lord. And this goes on for like five or six lengthy prayers, solemn collects, as we go back and forth on this day where the mercy of God is open for us as Christ is hanging on the cross. We ask him for all of these things. And you can read about them on the Book of Common Prayer, page 277 to 280. And then we have, I think, one of the most moving parts of the Good Friday liturgy, which is the veneration of the cross. That cross that's hung there will be covered in black, and we will process three times, from the door, back to the back, and up front. And every time, part of it is unveiled as the kind of full cross. Remember we heard from Pius Parch at the beginning? How slowly the church has been unveiling these mysteries. And now the full glory of Christ on the cross is revealed to us. This goes back to Egeria. And I love this passage from Egeria. Who's writing, remember, in the, three, the late 300s. Look how they used to venerate the cross then. 
the bishop's chair, and by the way, they're doing these events in the places that it happened. The bishop's chair is placed on Golgotha. Constantine's mama, Helen, built the first church in the early 300s over the spot of Christ's uh, crucifixion and empty tomb. All right? So the bishop seats on Golgotha. A table is placed before him with a cloth on it, and the deacons stand around. And there is brought to him a gold and silver box containing the holy wood of the cross. As Helen leveled a Roman uh, sanctuary, they found the cross and these places. So they actually had the wood of the cross. The box is opened, and the wood of the cross and the title, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Judeans, are taken out and placed on the table. As long as the holy wood is on the table, the bishop sits with his hands resting on either end of it and holds it down. And the deacons round him keep watch over it. They guard it because what happens now is that all the people, the catechumens as well as the faithful, come up one by one to the table. They stoop down over it, they kiss the holy wood and move on. But on one occasion, and I don't know when, one of them bit off a piece of the holy wood and stole it away. And for this reason, the deacons stand around and keep watch in case anyone dares to do it again. Can you imagine that? The deacon standing by, the bishop's holding it as you're kind of taking a hunk of it home with you. And the deacon slapped the back of your head so you spit it out and put it back in the box. Thus, all the people go past one by one. They stoop down. They touch the wood first with their forehead, then their eyes, and then they kiss it. No one puts his hand out to touch it. Notice when we come to... I mean, obviously, this is not the cross that Jesus died on. That's not... That's an image of Jesus on the cross. That's not actually Jesus on the cross. But remember, we're catapulted by these rites back to the events as if they're taking place today. And so when you come up to venerate the cross on Good Friday... You are standing at the cross. Spiritually, you're transported back to that. Now, how you want to reverence that is between you and Jesus. You heard the traditional way. You kiss it. Or you genuflect. Or you lay your hands on it. But we, what would you do if you were standing at the foot of the actual cross... ...where Christ was suffering and dying on it? That should be the same thing that you when you come up here on Good Friday. And you have that moment with Christ. You have that moment with Christ. After the cross is venerated, we have what's called the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts. Gifts that were already made holy. Bread and wine already made holy. Where was it made holy? Monday, Thursday. Remember, we took him into the room. Deacon Colleen will go bring Jesus back in. We have a confession of sin. We have the Lord's Prayer. We have communion. And then right after communion, we have a prayer. And then if you notice, there's no blessing. There's no dismissal. Y'all leave in silence. End of part two. End of part two. All right? Let's get to the big one. All right? Let's get to the great vigil of Easter. You're going to have time to talk about this one too. I hope I have time to talk about it all. I promise not to speed speak. This liturgy <laughs> is the mega liturgy of all liturgies. It's where all liturgies come from. All of them. Everything we do every Sunday comes from this one. Because up until really the early turn of the century, this was the Easter liturgy. If you go to an Orthodox church today, this is the Easter liturgy. There's no Easter sunrise. There's no Easter 8 a.m. There's no Easter morning. This is the Easter liturgy. And it's the mega liturgy. I remember some people saying, well, isn't Easter Sunday the big Alleluia moment? No, it's not. It's this liturgy. It's the great liturgy of Easter. This is where all the bells and whistles should be pulled out. Now, that's weird because in our modern context, which liturgy gets the most one? Like the 10 a.m. on Easter Sunday. But we didn't have that until the last ah, three, four hundred years, maybe. Because this is the big jalopy. This is where all goes down. All right? St. Augustine, preaching in 407. According to a most ancient tradition, meaning it goes back early. This night 
is one of vigil for the Lord. And the vigil celebrated during it to commemorate that holy night when the Lord rose from the dead is regarded as the mother of all holy vigils. We keep vigil on that night because the Lord rose from the dead. That life where there is no longer the sleep of death began for us in his flesh. Being thus risen, death will no more have dominion. For if we have kept vigil for the risen one, he will see that we shall reign with him forever. <laughs> Come to the Easter vigil and reign forever with Jesus. That's a pretty good bargain. Right? A cosmic prelude. The earth gets involved in worshiping this night. Which is pretty awesome. Why is Easter chosen when Easter is chosen? Spring? How's it chosen? Easter is chosen the first Sunday... ...after the first full moon... ...after the spring equinox. Notice how the alignment... ...spring, why? Spring is new life. Coming from the slumbers of winter... ...is new life. It's depicted by the paschal moon. Passover is depicted by moon. It's on a lunar cycle. The Easter celebration is done by the same way. The moon is the first thing God created... ...to teach us resurrection... Because the moon is the first thing in creation to die and to rise. The moon slowly goes down to nothing and then comes back up to the fullness. God in creating the moon the way he made it was a symbol to the world of the death and resurrection of his son. And so Easter is contingent on the first full moon after the spring equinox. How about them apples? That's pretty cool. You're going to talk about creation and new creation. There's a battle of light and darkness. One of my liturgy professors who's a deacon from Scotland, Owen Cummings, said it's as if nature cannot help but join in the praise and the greeting of that morning that transformed the world and all that is in it. How does the liturgy start? It starts by driving you crazy. I love it. About 10 till 9, I scream... All the lights are going out, and I have people fight me. It's like a battle to the death. We can't see. How are we going to see? We need more time. Right? Too bad. Off. Why? Owen oh, Cummings. As the congregation gathers in darkness and silence, they retreat into the past, as if it were, before Christ, before Passover. ...before the patriarchs, to a time before time... ...to the original emptiness out of which creation came. There are layers to that darkness. Because on this night the new creation began by our Lord's resurrection. So we begin in the darkness before God said let there be light. We're in darkness because Christ is laying in the tomb. We're in darkness because death right now is reigning. If you ever come here and you try to see me in the dark... ...you will see me kind of circle the altar like a shark. Because I'm praying... ...and I'm normally cussing out death. Because that's what you should be feeling. Christ is in the tomb, death is reigning. I begin to mock him. Gear up, buttercup. You're about ready to get your teeth knocked out. I, I will think of the people who have died and suffered death in our parish... I think about how death reigned forever. I think about how death goes in war and all kinds of stuff. And I will sit here and just get nasty with him. Right? That's what you're supposed to do. Quit fighting over the light and your flashlights and your phone on that time. Sit in the darkness for a little while. Sit and be with that stillness. Sit and be with all of that brokenness in your life that's about to get its teeth knocked out by the resurrection of Jesus. All right? Don't freak out when it gets dark. Just sit in here and let be, right? What's really kind of cool sometimes is if it's a clear night, you will see the Paschal moon through our windows, which I love. You will see it up there. And that's our, it's already the first signpost. Oh, death, where is your victory? Like Paul says, right? And then we go outside, right? Yes, we go outside. If it's snowing, if it's... Thir yes, we're going outside. All right? If it's cold, gather around. What happens next? The new fire. 
So I begin by calling us back to order. Phase three of this sacred triduum. Dear friends in Christ, on this most holy night, on which, now look at this, on which our Lord passed over from death to life. When did Jesus rise from the dead? When? What time? We don't know. In fact, I'm going to sing that in the Exaltet. This night which alone knows the hour when Christ rose from the dead. This early morning stuff when they get there in the dawn wasn't when he rose. They got there to see it empty. When they get there at dawn, the stone is already rolled back and the angels are saying, what took you so long? He's not here, he's risen, get to work. We just see the wound in creation that he made. But this night knows the hour. That's why the vigil is so important. The church invites her members dispersed throughout the world. All of us are celebrating this vigil gathered in prayer. For this night is the Passover of the Lord. In which by hearing his word and celebrating his sacraments. We share in his victory over death. And then this fire is lit. Let there be light. And in the midst of the darkness and death, the resurrection begins to shine. I bless the fire. Oh God, through your Son, you have bestowed on your people the brightness of your light. Sanctify this new fire. And grant that in this Paschal feast, we may burn so brightly with heavenly desires... ...that with pure minds we may attain to the festival of everlasting life. And then a candle is brought forth. A candle that sits by the baptismal font all year... ...the most important candle of the church year. It should be tall. It's made of beeswax. Because bees work together for the wax... ...as the church works together. Never artificial. Oh my gosh, I walk in churches... ...I see plastic candles. It's like seeing Botox in the church. Goodbye. This is not about that. You need... ...candles are people. They symbolize people. I mean, this is what I looked like three days ago... ...when my allergies were running... It strips, it breathes, it eats. Candles represent people. And if it's plastic and artificial, oh, Santa Maria. I, I go to, back in the day, I used to go to church. And if there was a plastic candle, I'd throw it in the garbage. And someone would say, where's the Paschal candle? I don't know. It's, some, it's disappeared. <laughs> and then we'd have to order a wax one. The candle brought forth is then consecrated. And when I bless the candle, look what is said over the candle. Christ, that symbol of the resurrection. That candle is a symbol of the risen Lord. Christ yesterday and today. The beginning and the end. The Alpha and the Omega. All time belongs to him. All the ages to him be glory forever and ever. And then if you notice, there's kind of five chunks that are in the candle. Those are incense grains because they represent the five wounds of Jesus. Incense is what priests use, right? It's the high priest prayers. By his holy and glorious wounds, may he guard us, may he protect us, Christ the Lord. Amen. And then I take the fire and I light the candle. Let the light of Christ and the resurrection, rising in glory, dispel the darkness of heart and mind. And then one of my favorite parts of the vigil, we all walk in the church. The church that was dead, the church that was dark. And that one singular flame comes in and you can see an orange glow all around the sanctuary. And the deacon sings the light of Christ. And we all thanks be to God. And then we walk to the middle, just as we're going to do with the cross on Good Friday. She lifts it higher and sings in a higher tone. The light of Christ Thanks be to God. And then that one candle, all the candles begin to be lit. All the candles begin to be lit. And then we sing it a third time. It is the most awesome experience. There's all kinds of things that are happening. God who said, let there be light and created the stars is doing that amidst us. What happened to Jesus when he died on the cross until the time he rose? On the, where did he go? You go to the Bahamas, it's been a rough week, I need a break. He goes to the dead. We say that in the Apostles' Creed. He sends to Sheol. You are watching him do that. You are watching the light of the resurrection come into the middle of the darkness and hearing all those righteous souls, Adam and Eve, Moses, Rachel, Miriam, David, John the Baptist, St. Joseph, all of them, 
the light of Christ, thanks be to God. As he's coming down to preach to those in Sheol and is ready to break it. We learn this from second from Peter. Peter tells us in his epistle that Christ went down to preach to the dead. What did he preach? Himself. Himself. We then sing the exaltet. That beautiful hymn of resurrection we're going to tackle in, in level three classes. First recorded in Rome around 418. Exalt, let them exalt the choirs of angels. Let them exalt the hosts of heaven. There are some beautiful, rich theological words. Let this holy building shake with joy for the resurrection. Woo, that should make the hair on the back of your neck stand up, right? And after the exaltet, and I lose my voice because I will sing it till the windows explode. We have... Possibly, we don't do all these, but the option to do nine readings. What did Christ do in Sheol? He began to preach himself and to reveal about all the scriptures revealed to him, just like he did to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. From Genesis, from the story of creation, the binding of Isaac, the flood, the Exodus account as we walk through the Red Sea, which is going to happen in a few short moments from baptism. Isaiah 2 the God's presence in the renewed Israel, the mystery of water, let them who thirst come to the water. Ezekiel, I will put in them a new heart and a new spirit. Ezekiel 23, them bones and bones and dry bones. And Zephaniah, rejoice, daughter of Zion. We hear this beautiful liturgy of the word that's all done in the dark because we are in Sheol with Christ. All right? Then, if you notice, when we have catechumens, and we're about nine hours into this thing, we call on the host of heaven. There'll be a procession around the church calling on all kinds of names of our loved ones who are in presence now in the risen Lord. We call on them as we go to the font. We bless the paschal water, which is so rich and beautiful. There's symbolism in it. I will make the sign of the cross in it. I throw it to the four corners of the ends of the earth. I dump the chrism oil in it. I blow on the form of the Pasai, the first letter of the spirit in the water. We plunge the candle like I'm making a salad right into the, right into the holy water font three times as Christ descends into the water. And then you all get hosed down. Because how do we participate in the death and resurrection of Christ... ...but in the waters of baptism? And after all of that is done... ...the big show. Right? We process back up here. I change vestments because there's always a costume change in theater. I change vestments. The acolytes light the candles on the altar... ...because we're about to begin the first liturgy of Easter... And I will turn around and say, Alleluia, for the first time, Christ is risen. This is the moment of resurrection. The darkness will be dispelled. All the lights come on and everything we could possibly ring, every bell and nook and cranny rings with resounding joy. Ring it loudly. This is literally, you get to watch the resurrection that no one got to participate in. Because now in the mystery, you are actually there. The joy begins to fill. We hear St. Paul's letter to the Romans. And then we have the unveiling of the Alleluia, which is an ancient Aramaic chant that you're going to hear Mother Lynn sing this year. Alleluia. It comes from a very ancient Aramaic, Aramaic chant. And then the Gospel of Easter is read. Then I proclaim the Easter liturgy from John Chrysostom. Then we receive the first Eucharist of Easter and the solemn blessing with the double alleluia. Go in the peace of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Woo. At your table for the next five minutes only. Talk about your experience of the vigil to your table. If you haven't been at one, what's your highlight? What's your favorite part? If you haven't been to one, how you're going to come this year? Because it's awesome. If there's people at your table that haven't come and people that love it, sell it to them. All right? If this talk didn't do it, talk about the vigil and we'll regroup in five minutes.
All right, everybody. Let's gather back together. I told, I told Sam earlier, oh, I'm probably not going to do a question and answer period. But guess what? Question and answer period. So questions about the Paschal Triduum, about the la Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, the Easter Vigil. Comments, questions. Wow, that's impressive. You have a here, go here, go ahead, Catherine. Speak in, by the way, when you when I hand you the microphone, speak into it so everyone can hear. This is just a comment that I learned from you that it is one continuous Eucharist for mm -hmm. the Triduum. And that was that has been very meaningful for me. Yeah. It's one long liturgy. And just think if you would go to a play and only come for the final act, you'd miss all of it. They're all meant to be together, and you can't understand one without the other. You can't understand Good Friday unless you know the resurrection. You can't know the resurrection unless you know Good Friday. So it's one long liturgy. That's why there's no ends, and it begins with Monday, Thursday, and the blessing and the dismissal doesn't happen until the Easter vigil. It's all one long liturgy. Can I ask a question about Palm Sunday? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Palm Sunday question, yeah. Okay, so when we were doing the readings, they were talking about Jesus sitting on a colt and a donkey. Yeah. How does that work? <laughs> a really good saddle. The, the, the small colt was tied to the donkey. Now, early church fathers have all kinds of interpretation of why that's the case. Some say because one represented the Jewish people who've been there forever, and the Gentiles would now be grafted in, the young foal. So that was maybe why that happened. So there's all kinds of different interpretations of why that happened. He didn't straddle two animals. <laughs> no, he was on one with another one chained to attached to him. But good, good question, good question. Don. Uh, back to Monday, Thursday, we were talking here, and I shared my experience with washing each other's feet. I went to a Crucio in California, and the group washed each other's feet. Yeah, but we would go right down the line. It mm. was very meaningful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are beautiful. That's be it's a, such a beautiful ritual. <laughs> okay, so we're... So on Friday, on Good Friday, yeah. so what is the difference between the 3 p.m. and the 7.30? Oh, good, good, good. So if you notice, we turn into a monastery on Good Friday here, right? So we have 9 o'clock morning prayer, the official morning prayer of the church, just like you had, we had evening prayer tonight. At 10.30, it's called terse, or the third hour, or mid-morning prayer. It's a shorter prayer service. At 11.30, we have the Stations of the Cross. Teaser trailer, I wrote the Stations this year. And they're going to be seen uh, through first-person eyewitnesses from the actual people who participated in, in the Stations. And uh, Drew and Christy Vucolo are actually going to be dramatic readers of that. So it's really meant to catapult us into the stations. Bring your Kleenex, because I was crying as I was writing them. So after the stations of the cross, we will wash the altar as Jesus' body was taken down from the cross by Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. The altar is washed with rose water and anointed with uh, aromatic things. Chrism, not the chrism oil, but balsam and all kinds of stuff. We'll have a, late Lenten, a, light, a light Lenten lunch. Then at 1 o'clock, we will have known, or the ninth hour of prayer, mid-afternoon prayer. And then at 3 o'clock, when the time that our Lord died on the cross, is when we will have the liturgy I spoke of today. So the solemn passion and death of the Lord. So that's the big, long liturgy that I talked about. After they, he died on the cross, what happened? They took him down, and he was buried. That's the 730 liturgy. It comes from the Eastern Orthodox tradition. It's called Lamentations. There'll be prayers about him descending into Sheol. We literally will take that image of Christ from the cross as we all sing, Were You There? And I actually lay him in a shroud. And there'll be mourning rituals, and then you'll be able to come up to venerate Christ being laid in the tomb. And that's only done in darkness by candlelight, just as the Easter Vigil, which is really kind of powerful. So the 3 o'clock liturgy is the church's solemn liturgy. The 730 liturgy is kind of like a tenebrae, a, a, an extra liturgical service, but it's about taking Christ from the cross and laying him in the tomb. Very, very powerful service. Jane and Stephanie are joining me on some of those chants this year, which will be pretty awesome. 
Okay, I have a question about the Great Watch. Don't let me forget, but I had to first say the Stations of the Cross. I can't ever think about the Stations of the Cross without thinking of our gospel, to, according to Harry Potter, when we had the, the Dementors, where we were yeah. going around and doing the Stations of the Cross with the Dementors. Mm -hmm. That was awesome. Um, that probably needs to happen again. Yeah, it, yeah, it really <laughs> does need to happen again. It hasn't happened since COVID, but it's really... October, October. It's really amazing. Um, but no, the Great Watch. So when David and I were first... Um, when we were dating, before when we decided we wanted to start going to the Episcopal Church, we attended a, a, a congregation in Statesboro, Georgia, which is um, on the states on the Georgia Southern campus. They had a great watch where you signed up to take an hour and come and and stay. And I think they did it all through the night. Yes. I yes. wondered if that was something that this that, that is is there a great watch all through the night here? No. Okay. So there's two traditions with that. When I first arrived here, I tried to do what Linda said. So we had a sign-up sheet for people to take hours, and I would have done it all night, but I was the only one who signed up. <laughs> and I love Jesus, but it's hard for me to do all that all night, okay? So plus, we also do the whole day on Good Friday. The other tradition is to stop the Great Watch at midnight, because that's about the time Jesus was arrested and taken into the, the, the hands of Annas and Caiaphas in prison. So there's a tradition of ending the watch at midnight for that reason, which is kind of what we do here. So we will begin the great watch at 11 o'clock. We will pray matins or tenebrae, the official church's night evening vigil watch for Good Friday. And then when that's completed, we'll all go home. Uh, but yes, there's two ways of doing that. If we didn't do the full day Good Friday, I would probably do the lengthy night watch. But since we do all of those hours on Good Friday, that's a way for us to also stay awake with our Lord, too. Other questions and comments? Someone asked at another table, well, how long is the vigil? It's real short. Not about 20 minutes. Um, it's about as long as today's Mass was. <laughs> no. Back in the day, church, we all laugh about this, but back in the day when St. Augustine's and Egeria, they would start the vigil around midnight and it would go until the dawn. It would go until the dawn. Then there was one rip-roaring lunch and everyone went home and went to bed. And then you came back Easter Sunday night for Agape Vespers, which was Vesper service with a parish potluck to celebrate the resurrection. But there was no eight o'clock morning Eucharist. <laughs> because as the sun came up, you were coming out of church. So it is a lengthy service. It's good two hours. If there's a baptism, it could be three, depending. But for the most part, it's about two hours. That's how lengthy the vigil is. Anything else? Any other questions? Uh, not about Holy Week, but this diocese. Does the bishop do a chrism mass on Tuesday at the cathedral in Cincinnati? So the bishop, uh, Russell mentioned the chrism mass. That's done at Proctor on Tuesday. So all the clergy gather with the bishop. He will consecrate the chrism oil. He consecrates the oil of the sick. And all of the clergy, deacons and priests, renew our vows. Chrism. Proctor is the retreat center. You know Proctor and Gamble? Toothbrush? He was a huge Episcopalian. And when he died, he left all of it to the Diocese of Southern Ohio. That's why we have the golden calf. I mean, a lot of money in this diocese. Uh, called the Proctor Fund. And he left his family farm. Proctor Farms, which is a huge retreat center and camp in our diocese. And since it's central, that's where the bishop will gather on Tuesday. Peggy. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the Chrism Mass in a lot of Episcopal dioceses and in all the Roman Catholic dioceses is a big deal. It's normally done on Thursday morning. Uh, but it's been kind of pushed off because of all the other stuff that goes on on Thursday, especially dioceses that are large, to normally Tuesday of Holy Week. It's normally a big deal and open in this diocese. And believe me, it drives me crazy. It is not. It is sadly not. But I wish it was bigger. But we can't have all nice things. Anything else? I know we were going to end with Compline, but we're going to skip that because I know you're all ready to go home. So let us pray, and then we'll dismiss. Cool? The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, during this week in which you changed the course of human history, we ask that you send forth the Holy Spirit upon us mightily. Give us to live this week holy. 
that we may walk with you every step of the way through your passion, death, and resurrection, that we may arrive at Easter with joy beyond all telling, for you have told us those who wait with you will rise with you. We ask all these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Come to Holy Week. It's pretty awesome. God bless you all, and we'll hope to see you through all the liturgies of this week. <laughs>